Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Bonnie for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. Um, this is, of course, an extremely urgent topic of a tremendous impact. And as uh, someone that, um, that is also struggling, we're all in the same table to try to address it. I'm very grateful for your efforts on coming up and addressing the issues that need to be taken into account. I'm do going to actually confide my prejudices in life. I believe that science is an extremely important solution. And as such, I'm going to be highlighting its relevance in addressing the prescription opioid epidemic. So, and I, and the problem is I don't really know what you've heard in the past or before. Um, so I hope that I'm not coming up with data that you've seen before. I've tried to actually, I know that you've uh, already heard from others. But without that knowledge, I'm going to try to summarize from my perspective where I think the issues are. It's always good to try to see a complex problem. Uh, where did it originate? And, in, and of course, I thought about it a lot. And I, I, I have to unfortunately recognize that this is a problem, the prescription opioid, that was generated by the healthcare system. And we need to recognize it, because otherwise we're not going to be able to be truthful and come up with the solutions that are needed to revert it. Why did it happen in the healthcare system? Of course, there are multiple factors that, that come to play, but I would say there are two fundamental ones. One of them is the scarcity of resources that we have to address the management of uh, chronic pain in patients suffering from it, which is actually a huge number of them. Uh, and the IOM did a very good report on this. And the other one is the um, reluctance of, over so many years of the healthcare system to get involved in addressing issues of substance use disorder to the extent that the healthcare system has not even prioritized the training and education of those involved with it on the recognition of what a substance use disorder is and why and how to actually treat it. These two colliding issues, the, the, the need for the lack of treatment for pain that leads to over-reliance on opioids which have addictive properties on the one hand, and the other one in a system that has ignored substance use disorders all along as if there was something that is not the responsibility for us as a system to address. So what are um, the numbers in the, as it relates to the abuse of prescription medications? And I'm going to focus on prescription medications or opioid medications. But I do want to make a statement. We're paying attention to opioid medications because we have a tragedy in our hands. But it's not the only problem that we have with prescription, with abuse of prescription medications, or the potential of having another disaster. So as we go through it, we have to be mindful of this. 27 million people abuse um, our current drug use uh, in the United States of illicit, any illicit drug. Most of it is driven by marijuana, 22.2 million. Psychotherapeutics is 6.4 million. And of the psychotherapeutics, the number one is pain relievers, approximately 4 million. Then we have stimulant drugs and sedative hypnotics, but predominantly benzodiazepines. As you know, why, why are prescription opioids actually used for abuse and diverted? Well, uh, prescription opioids, uh, we know, uh, pharmacologically, they are very well understood they activate mu opioid receptors. And some of these prescription opioids also activate other opioid receptor systems. But what's common among all of them is the mu opioid receptor system. And here is a positron emission tomograph that uh, addresses the distribution of the mu opioid receptor in the human brain. And uh, you see that it's distributed in subcortical and cortical regions. And in uh, brown, I've identified key areas that are part of what we call the pain network. And that includes the periaqueductal gray, the thalamus, and the anterior uh, single leg gyrus, ACC. And that's why opioid medications are so superb at addressing, at interrupting severe acute pain. There are two problems with these uh, drugs. The one of them is they are very good at immediately interrupting pain, but you become tolerant very rapidly. So that means that you require increasingly higher doses in order to achieve the same level of analgesia. And this notion of tolerance that, uh, that occurs with opioids 
is one of the main problems that we have in relying so extensively on the use of prescription opioids for the management of chronic pain. Uh, the other one, the other main, main issue is that you also have very high concentrations of myopioid receptors in key reward centers of the brain. And this is why the same drugs can be very potent analgesics, but they are also highly rewarding. And by, by activation of these reward centers, they can produce the neuro adaptations that result in addiction on those that are vulnerable. And indeed, uh, opioid drugs, opioid agonist drugs are among the most addictive of the drugs of abuse. Now, what, what happened? We've had all of these prescription opioids for so many years. Why now? Well, I think that we have to look at our prescription practices, and you probably heard of this already, but there was an event that changed the practice of prescription opioids in our country, leading to very steep increases on the rate at which we were prescribing. And it was a very well-intentioned move by the Joint Accreditation Committee to require that hospitals, in order to get accreditation, screen and treat patients suffering from pain because pain can be a devastating condition. So it was a very well intention. It happened in uh, 2000, and you can clearly see there you have for two different types of drugs, hydrocodone and oxycodone, both of them, the, uh, the oxycodone is in blue and the hydrocodone is in red. My computer swallowed the legend over there. <laughs> But when you take all of the op um, potential opioid prescriptions that we have, it's been estimated that as a nation we are prescribing more than 230, 40 million prescriptions a year. Just think about the number it means. And in the uh, report of the IOM, uh, it was estimated that approximately 100 million people are suffering uh, from pain. But we know that opioid prescriptions should be just uh, limited to those that are more severe pain. And you come across that there's a discrepancy between the number of pills that we are generating, because these are prescriptions now, you multiply that by number of pills that are being prescribed there, and you come with billions of pills that are actually being diverted, being available for diversion, that are causing the addiction, and also, again, when not uh, related to diversion, are leading to an overprescription practice that is accounting for some of the overdoses that we're seeing in people that are properly prescribed the medication. Well, prescribed the medications, I don't know, I shouldn't call it necessarily properly, but prescribed the medication for pain. Is there a problem? And you can say, well, those numbers tell me in my brain there's a problem. But I also, if that is not enough, look at our country in terms of the distribution of number of prescriptions of opioids per 100 people. And you see a tremendous disparity across the regions. And you can say, well, is there a geographical reason why for example, all of these regions, Louisiana or Oklahoma, have much higher levels of pain that require that they be prescribed so much more than a place like, like uh, Texas, for example. It's clearly no. This reflects prescription practices that facilitate overprescribing more in some places than other. And this is the United States. If you compare us with other countries in terms of the numbers of prescription opioids that we prescribe, you come along in some instances that we prescribe more than 90% of the hydrocodone type formulations across the whole world. So we either are over prescribing or we have a nation in severe pain, which we know is not the case. So addressing the concept that that very good intention of let's screen pain, let's treat it, has resulted in an over-reliance on prescription opioids. And I'm going to say it again. We don't have many alternatives as doctors in addressing pain. And that's one of the issues that in my, brain, in my brain needs to be addressed to deal with this epidemic and prevent it in the future. So this is what has attracted the attention of so many agencies. The consequences that have come out of people diverting, abusing, and misprescription practices. The number of people that are dying. And so just to your left is prescription opioids, and you probably have seen this because it's so dramatic. In 2014, there were 18,000, more than 18,000 people dying from prescription opioids. We were very excited on 2012 and 2013 because it seemed to have leveled off. 
And also, if you look at the number of prescription opioids, they started to slowly go down. So in 2014, when the numbers came up so high, this actually led us to realize that what we are doing has not been sufficient. And indeed, the numbers are going to come up soon for 2015. And I don't know exactly what they are. I've overheard that they don't look like there's going to be a decrease, unfortunately. So we will find out, but it doesn't look like we've addressed, we've been able to turn around these deaths. Now, on top, if that were not sufficient, look at what has happened with the deaths from heroin. And this has been uh, um, the most dramatic, steep increase that I've, er that I've seen since I've been director at NIDA. We've seen numbers of uh, people dying from overdoses from heroin around 2,000 for many, many years. And then on 2009, you start to see them go up. And from 2000, and from 2000 we now have 10,000. Now you look at the numbers and say, what is going on? Now, if you look at the number of people that are actually increasing in injection of heroin, it's increasing. And it is 75% or 80% of them are people that become addicted to the prescription opioid. They start with prescription opioid and then they shift to heroin because it's less expensive and more available. And, and it's important to address it because I've heard it many times. The problem that we are having heroin right now is because we're making prescription opioids very difficult to come about. That's not the problem. The problem is these people are becoming addicted to the prescription opioids, then they shift to heroin. And that's a very big difference on the way that this is narrated. So I, I was saying, there has increased. It has increased the people uh, in, in, that are engaged in heroin, but it has increased 50%. That does not account for those deaths. So what is it telling us? It's telling us, number one, that that heroin is much more um, potent. And we know that the potency is going up, and therefore it's increasing in terms of its lethality. But the other one that it's telling us is that it's being mixed with synthetic opioids that are even more potent than heroin. And we've heard a lot about fentanyl. You probably heard a lot of, about fentanyl and its derivatives. And so the, the combination of pure heroin and accessing to the market of these synthetic opioids is probably accounting for these very, very high levels of lethality that we're seeing with heroin that cannot be explained just on the number of people that are becoming addicted to opioids. Very important also. And again, I don't want to uh, under um, state it because we have to be aware of it. When you look at the forensic reports, you also come to realize that most of these cases of people dying are also done in combination of drugs. And the most cited reference is combination of opioids with benzodiazepines. We actually do not know, but we suspect also heavily that there's a combination of alcohol with opioids. And, and, uh, the, and I'm bringing it up because this relates, of course, to the notion of improper prescription practices where physicians are not asking whether a patient is on benzodiazepine before prescribing an opioid or recommending them to be cautious with that combination, including that of alcohol, and or alternative, the fact that we are also know that people are abusing benzodiazepines. And the other element that we don't really know and recognize in these numbers, but I would say it's not negligible, and just for the, the sake of giving you a number, I predict it's going to be between 10 and 15 percent with huge error margins, because I'm just speculating, are suicides. And that's another component, because we also know that the number of suicides is going up in the United States. So again, I told you shamelessly, I believe that the solutions are coming. Science is indispensable for these solutions. We don't speak about it, but it is. So number one item, we need to expand the number of alternatives for the treatment of, pain, of patients with pain. Severe pain is one of the factors that contributes to suicide, among other devastating consequences. So if someone is on severe pain, you need to address it. And that's why, of course, doctors limited are relying on, on opioids at one level. So we at uh, NIDA, along with other institutes at the NIH, in predominantly the Neurological Institute, NINDS, for diseases and stroke, are involved in facilitating the development of medications for pain. Now, this you might have heard or you may have not, but in general, we are very good at the NIH of developing knowledge that then pharmaceuticals can take in order to deliver a product and treatment. 
and that has worked very, very well, except for the past five, I would sort of say 10 years, and it has been more as of recent than as of the 10 years, pharmaceutical has have disengaged themselves for the development of psychotherapeutics, but they have also disengaged themselves for the development of analgesics. Now, I've, I've tried to understand why. This is a gigantic market with devastating consequences, and yet the level of investments of pharmaceutical industry on new medications is limited. There are some spaces that they are working actually more than others, and that is in opioid deterrent formulations, and we're also, as agencies, also working on it. What does that mean? For an, for an opioid drug to be maximally rewarding, you want it to get very rapidly into the brain, and that's why you can take a tablet, crush it, snort it, inject it. So one of the things that they can do to avoid that is the prod drug. So that means that it needs, for example, to go through the gastrointestinal system in order to be activated, so you cannot inject it. Or temper resistor formulations, for obvious reasons, you cannot destroy them, extract, or draw combinations with adverse effects if injected. These are the low-hanging fruits. And the F FDA came up with um, the, the notion that they would accept, as an indication, deterrent formulations. And that incentivized the pharmaceuticals. But again, I'm going to, to speak as, 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 as a second level of, of, uh, of argument. It's, it's very well undone if the pharmaceuticals invest on these temper resistant formulations. They are going to be more expensive than the regular opioid analgesics. So if the insurances are not going to cover in their formulary, they are not going to be dispensed. So these I call structural changes in parallel to the scientific ones that need to be addressed in the healthcare system for us in the science world or the pharmaceutical industry world coming up with products to have an impact. And then the other side, the side to the right, which is actually much more difficult than the one to the left, the, the low hanging fruit, and which is can we develop medications for pain that are as effective as those of opioids but uh, without having the side effects. And that's where the challenge comes, and that's where the NIH can play an important role, and we're very much engaged on that. For example, uh, cannabinoids. Cannabinoids uh, offer a wide variety of compounds that have potential as analgesics. Inflammatory mediators, and that's in and of itself even more interesting than the classical way that we look at analgesics. Because if you can interfere with the inflammatory mediators that then cause that trauma to the tissue that results in the pain, not only are you providing analgesia, but you are actually preventing it from happening. You're preventing the pathological process. Ion channel blockers is another extremely interesting area of research and development. And at the same time, in the whole area of the brain where we're starting to learn with new tools and technologies to actually understand how it works and how can we actually uh, change and modify the function of certain networks, there are now other alternatives, uh, surgical interventions. Uh, for example, deep brain stimulation has been a strategy that had been trying actually many, many years ago for the management of pain, and now it's been reconsidered. Neural stimulation with things like transcranial magnetic stimulation of deep brain stimulation, spinal cord stimulation, peripheral nerve stimulation. So there, there are several strategies that are, are, are going on in parallel to the one that is targeting medications. I, cannot, I couldn't resist, actually, because the, the science of beauty just emerges as we actually just pay attention. And, and if we just look at it, we can come up with solutions. And this is an example. And it comes out of genetic research. And this is in where um, researchers described a congenital condition where the patients do not have any perception of pain. And when they went to actually try to understand why is it that these individuals don't have pain, they identify the mutation on the gene that targets the sodium uh, voltage channel, NAV 1.7. And this mutation actually confers the ability of that particular individual, which is not an ability, it actually can be quite harmful for them not to be able to perceive pain, but they don't perceive pain. Similarly, genetic studies have now been able to show mutations in that same gene that enhance the sensitivity of pain. 
So obviously this generated an enormous amount of interest on the pharmaceutical to try to emulate it. So the question is, if you get a, a channel, sodium channel, voltage sodium channel antagonist, can you actually have analgesia? And, and there were several companies that have a work on it. Uh, they are actively two or three clinical trials ongoing. It's, it's a, certainly, there are some issues that can make it harder to develop, but this is a, a target with still um, a lot of interest in terms of its potential. Another area too, and we've heard a lot of it in terms of, and again, I'm advertising science because I think that it is, is so fundamental, is the whole issue of precision medicine. Our ability to look at medicine in different ways than we were in the past, and that includes in the terms of the pharmaceutical development of a compound. So now we do these gigantic randomized clinical trials that cost millions and millions of dollars. We actually have our main outcome. Do we find it or do we don't find it? And what happens for all of us in some substance use disorder treatments is that we see some patients that do respond very nicely, but then many others do not. And that doesn't mean the main outcome, so that that drug is killed. And or alternatively, we have very good outcomes, but then there is an adverse effect in a couple of patients, and that drug is killed. So now we have the tools to try to understand what is it that made that patient respond, and what is it that made that patient have a side effect. And then therefore, tailor the intervention on the basis of whether you're going to be sensitive to its uh, therapeutic effects or avoid it if you're going to be sensitive to its adverse effects. And for opioids, for example, uh, researchers have already identified that polymorphism in the mu opioid uh, receptor gene that actually addresses thing, um, a factor that is relevant, which is your vulnerability for addiction. So if you have this variant on the opioid uh, mu receptor gene, you actually can see there the variant. You have a lower concentration of these receptors, but you're also higher, have higher vulnerability for becoming addicted to opioids or to alcohol. And this variant also determines your sensitivity to the therapeutic benefits of uh, being treated with an, an opioid antagonist. And so this type of research obviously can then therefore be extended to maximize not just the target of the medication, which is the myopioid receptor, but also other targets like enzymes that are involved in the metabolism of the compounds that we're dealing with that can either result in, in toxicity because you don't metabolize it, it gets very, very high concentrations, and or alternatively, a catabolism that results in no therapeutic benefits because you just degrade the, the, the medication. A beautiful example about how uh, science comes up with solutions, and I'm actually advertising it because this was born out of science that was led by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, but also our successful partnership with pharmaceutical companies. We know, and, and, and it was, it just hit me and sort of says many, many years ago, I says, oh my God, it's a horrible thing, the prescription opioid ep epidemic, but at least we're lucky to have an opioid antagonist that we can use and revert it, and that's naloxone. And we've known that for years and years and years. And the beauty of naloxone is if you inject it, it has absolutely no untoward effects. If you, unless you are an addicted person, it will trigger withdrawal. But any one of us, if we make a, a mistake in the diagnosis, you inject me, I have no negative effects are known of naloxone. And it's very effective, provided you administer it at the right dose and in time. And so, but you need to inject it. So, and that has made it harder to actually implement. So we partnered with uh, two pharmaceutical companies. One of them was successful and got a product that was approved by FDA on November 2015 to deliver it as a nas nasal spray. And this is as user-friendly as it gets. But what's important about it is not that it's user-friendly. Look at the data that led to the FDA approval. In order to save a life with naloxone, you need to deliver sufficient quantities very, very rapidly. And that hasn't been proven by many of the forms that people normally take as a range and they inject and, and then, then they, the patient may, may come out or not. With an, the nasal intranasal, you actually get even higher doses than what you're getting with the injectable. And this is what led the FDA to approve it. Now, and it's also the beauty about it is the company came up with a very, very low price, making it not just an effective, but very affordable 
and accessible because any one of us can administer it. And again, this is the beauty of science. We can use knowledge and transfer it into a solution that then in partnerships, and again, the value of partnerships can be deployed into the public. I mean, of course, our challenge now, now is to ensure that it's being used. Because interestingly, in many places, and I travel a lot, they are still using these syringes that you have to put and you have to actually squirt. And you don't know, you, don't, you have absolutely no idea on your efficacy on the product. So here we have an example again of structural changes. So if you as a company develop all of these uh, technologies, it's approved by the FDA, and then there's no means of sustaining, even if it's so cheap, then we need to do something to actually ensure that these products are utilized optimally because it does mean a big difference if you are not able to provide the adequate delivery of the naloxone. Then my last, uh, my last, that, the, the last component in this one, so it's pain, the development of antidotes against overdoses, and then the treatment of the substance use disorders. If you have pain and you are prescribed an opioid, contrary to what we were taught in medical school, and I was taught that, you can become addicted. And this myth that you don't become addicted if you have pain and you get an opioid led many physicians to over rely on its prescription. As long as they say, as long as the patient has pain, they are not going to become addicted. Well, that's incorrect. A certain percentage of patients will become addicted. We don't know exactly what percentage, and again, just in terms of numbers, I, I, I'm going to give you a number with margins of errors. I would say probably 10%. It has margins of errors, but just looking in the range of what's reported. Can we, can I predict who's going to become addicted or not? No, I can't. Any, it, there, there is an uncertainty. I know certain factors that can increase the likelihood of a person becoming addicted. Very simple. Have you been addicted in the past? It's, it's a red mark because if you have the vulnerability for addiction, these drugs are very addictive. So you are going to be in risk. In your family, do you have a history of addiction? And, wh and what's striking about this, these very obvious things, is that doctors are not asking necessarily the question. And they are prescribing these medications without the proper surveillance on individuals at high risk. And I'm, I'm bringing it up because I'm highlighting the, the relevance of education. And it's education not just on the proper management of prescription opioids, but education on the screening and recognition of substance use disorders. It is as elemental as this, how badly physicians are trained in the substance use disorders. And it's, and it's as bad as it gets. Many physicians, and I, I, I don't um, even exclude the psychiatrists, which we are supposed to be experts on this field, don't recognize the difference between addiction and physical dependence. All, in any one of us, an opioids will produce physical dependence. That means that actually there are physical changes that result from the stimulation of that mu opioid receptor that will lead to a down-regulation of signaling in such a way that if you remove it, you're going to have physical withdrawal. And physical dependence happens very rapidly, and it emerges in a couple, I mean, it depends on variability, but in a couple of days, if you're given opioid medications, you will have physical <laughs> dependence. Very. But it's very easy to treat, and you go through the withdrawal, and then after a few days or a week, you are off it. And that's very different from addiction. Addiction does not happen on everybody, perhaps on 10%. It's a much more complex neuroplasticity process, much lower to emerge, but it's much, once you stop taking the drug, it persists for a much longer uh, period of time, and it's much more difficult to treat than withdrawal. So that's just to illustrate how simple topics, terms, are actually not even understood properly in the healthcare system. And this lack of understanding leads everybody, some physicians to say, I'm never going to prescribe an opioid because they confuse physical dependence and withdrawal with addiction when a patient could benefit from an opioid. And there are certain instances where opioids can be very beneficial. But in another, since they don't really understand and they say, well, it has pain, they are not going to become addicted, they become overconfident and overprescribe, and that patient becomes addicted. So if the patient, uh, and whether it is for pain or the majority of them that become because they actually are abusing these, these drugs, they are quite rewarding and reinforcing, uh, become addicted, we're very lucky also in, as it relates to the opioid use disorders. We have medications 
We don't have medications for cocaine, methamphetamine, marijuana. We don't. I wish we had, but we don't. But here we have. And they are targeting all of our medications that we currently have, target the opioid receptor system. They are either full agonists like methadone, that means they produce maximal effect with relatively low levels of receptor occupancy. Partial agonists like buprenorphine, which means they occupy all of the receptors, but even with occupying all of the receptors, you don't get, ever get maximal effects. And then you have the antagonists that actually just bind to the receptor and have no signaling process. And the three of them have different characteristics, advantages and disadvantages. All of the three medications have been shown to actually prevent overdoses. They have been shown to prevent um, infections with hepatitis C and HIV, which are uh, downstream consequences of abusing these uh, drugs via injection routes. They also improve the outcomes on neonatal abstinence syndrome, except for Vivitrol for naltrexone that hasn't been studied. And yet, despite these benefits, and they, by the way, also prevent relapse and, and allow the person to recover much faster than without them, despite these multiple benefits, they are not being used. So, and how bad is that? Well, the uh, SAMHSA, SAMHSA, which is actually evaluating the numbers of individuals that are need, in need of treatment and those that receive it, estimates that approximately probably less than 15% of patients that suffer from an addiction that could be treated will be treated overall. And these are slides that just actually show you the number of programs that are offering FDA-approved substance use medications. So you have some of them for alcohol, but then you have the ones for buprenorphine, methadone, tablet, naltrexone, injectable naltrexone, and you can see that overall is approximately 20% or less. Uh, of those are being offered to, to individuals. I mean, and, and why is that? So why is this so low level of prescription? Well, one of them is, I think, in terms of, uh, we stated, well, the lack of infrastructure to be able to take care of all of these patients, that's one. But there's also an issue of stigma that in my brain comes out of ignorance, and which in part reflects the lack of education in healthcare systems as well as on specialized treatment programs about what these medications do and do not which are just dismissed, particularly the agonists, by saying you're substituting one drug from the other, without really an understanding of the differences on how these drugs act versus uh, when someone is injecting or abusing uh, by other routes, uh, heroin or the other prescription medications. So to address the issue of infrastructure, one of the, the aspects that we're doing at NIDA is developing research of implementation. How do we take advantage of the healthcare system to implement and have physicians use that healthcare system to treat those with substance use disorders. What a better place to start than the emergency room where you're getting all of these patients coming in with overdoses. And typically, there comes a patient with an overdose, the, pay, the physicians will treat them and then goodbye. And if they are lucky, they will refer them to a treatment program for their opioid use disorder. So in this uh, clinical trial on an emergency room, they actually tested a very simple operation. Emergency room physicians have started to engage in actually treating patients when they are there. Well, what not try with in terms of an opioid use disorder? So in this particular uh, study, they were having the emergency room uh, doctors directly administer the buprenorphine when the patient ends up in the emergency room and then refer them to treatment, as opposed to the other sides where we're basically a referral to a treatment or doing a brief intervention there. And what they show is that very simple thing, just give them the buprenorphine in the emergency room will increase the likelihood that they will stay in treatment, that would follow up with treatment, that they will need the care for specialized treatment, and they also decreases the likelihood that they will be utilizing emergency rooms into the future. Simple intervention as that. So we're currently extending that into a large clinical trial to, ac to assess the extent to which it's going to be uh, sustainable and acceptable across uh, various emergency rooms in the United States. Another example, the, the, uh, the, the criminal justice setting. Many patients with substance use disorders, including opioid use disorders, end up in the criminal justice system. So these very, uh, but the criminal justice system rejects overall the use of opioid medications, even though, again, opioid medications have shown to improve outcomes in prisoners. 
in many, for many, many parameters, but there is a cultural issue there. So here is where antagonists can play an extremely important role because then the criminal justice system, which is justifying not intervening with opioid agonists because they are agonists, may have an alternative to work with. And in this is a recent study that was published in patients, uh, in individuals on the criminal justice setting, setting that shows significant improvement in, the, in outcomes when you are providing with their extended release naltrexone, Vivitrol, versus treatment as usual in, in the criminal justice system. And you can see that the abstinence is much higher, significantly higher in those treated. But very important, look at what happens at 78 weeks. This is overdoses in 78 weeks. When you are an opioid, uh, have an opioid use disorder and you're in the criminal justice system and you're liberated, your risk of overdosing and dying are much higher. Well, there were no overdoses on the naltrexone where there are seven overdoses in the individuals that were treated as usual. Again, highlighting how the, the important relevance of being able to implement these tools that we currently have. And, and, and two, I also look at it uh, in, in sort of uh, the perspective of opioid use disorders. I'm very happy that we have medications. We have three different classes. You know how many classes they have for antiretroviral therapy for HIV? And it's wonderful. I think that that has made a transformative difference. Uh, for antivirals for hepatitis C, there are at least 25 uh, medications that can cure you. Whether we use them or not, that's another issue, but they have been developed. We have three classes. So there's definitely a road for improvement. And this is an example to, uh, again, a low hanging fruit, extended release ways of administering buprenorphine so the patient doesn't have to go on a daily by basis or three or four times a week in order to get its treatment. This is a six month, and that facilitating um, their, their compliance. But the issue to which we can succeed as we develop these alternatives, and this was also an ex a, a successful partnership with a private company, it relies on the structural changes that will hopefully cover for this type of intervention. And finally, the point that you probably have heard, but I'm going to reiterate because it's, it may not be as sexy a science, which is education. And I cannot have something that speaks for itself, but the reality to tell you why we need to educate. These were patients uh, that were followed in the, that had ended up in the hospital with an overdose that patients that who had been treated for their pain. And it shows that overall, most of the patients were given much higher doses that were recommended. They overdosed and then the researchers followed them prospectively to see what happens. Even though they overdosed, 63% of those individuals continued on the same dose of their, their high levels of opioid medication, 63%. Of course, 17% of them had a second overdose. And yet, we clearly know that an overdose, if you've overdosed, that indicates you are at a much higher risk of a second overdose. And as a clinician, it behooves you to actually either discontinue the opioid in that patient or decrease it. And, and simple practices as this one are not happening. And look, this is a paper that was published in 2016. So this is going on. So we can speak about definitely the importance of science, and it's crucial. It gives us the tools. But we also have to recognize the relevance of education on the healthcare system. And that's not just physicians. It means pharmacies, nurses, nurses assistants, dentists. All of those engage in the management of pain on two aspects. One of them, better, better treatment and, uh, and, the, and better education on the screening and treatment of pain on the one hand, and on the other one, better uh, education on the screening and treatment of substance use disorders. This knowledge will allow clinicians not only to prevent uh, them from doing practices that are very, very ne negative, but also to maximize the outcomes on their patients. And my last point is, and I've been describing this because I write about it and I speak about it and I get emails from physicians all over the country and they say, yes, we recognize that opioids are not the panacea and we recognize that there are medications in certain instances that would be better. But they also say to me, but it's extremely difficult to actually get the paperwork to approve for those medications or those multi-pronged approaches for the treatment of chronic pain. And in some instances, the insurances will not pay. So as I've been very much focused on the science, it has also become clear that in parallel, uh, along with the issue of education, we have to develop structural changes in our healthcare system 
to allow physicians to do the right thing in order to optimize the treatment of their patients. And that may require in certain instances that they cover treatments that right now may be more expensive than an opioid medication, but on the long run will actually be saving the life of the person, but also in terms of budgets will be much more cost effective. Thanks very much.